We're looking at the parable of the talents and the parable of the minas in today's study. And uh, while these two parables are very similar, yet there are some significant differences between the two as well. The parable of the talents comes right after the parable of the ten virgins recorded in Matthew's gospel in chapter 25. And this was during uh, the week of Christ's passion, his last week in Jerusalem. In uh, Luke's gospel, the, the parable of the minas is recorded after Jesus visits the house of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And this is just before his triumphal entry uh, into the city of Jerusalem at the beginning of Passion Week, uh, according to Luke's gospel. In the parable of the talents, each uh, servant is given a different amount of money while in the parable of the minas, each one receives the same amount. And in addition, the uh, talents uh, talks about certain citizens that are introduced into the story who rebel against the nobleman and even send a delegation to say that they do not want him to rule over them. Uh, in both of the parables, those who have faithfully used the money that was entrusted to them receive similar commendations and rewards. Those who are unfaithful and who refuse to work for the master are condemned and punished. In both parables, the money belongs to the master and the servants are just entrusted with it and expected to use it faithfully during their master's long delayed return. We're in this third uh, series of parables, and we're looking at the last two, the parable of the talents and the parable of the minas. We want to read now from uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. 
And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well, good. well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two talents more besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering you where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Once again, uh, the Lord introduces this parable with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. And so we are bidden by the Lord to listen and to understand some fundamental truths about the Lord's kingdom. The man is traveling to a far country, so it is understood that it will be a while before he returns. As in the parable of the ten virgins, there is no indication of a precise time for his return. Uh, the servants had ample time to put the talents to work, and we might note that all of them had the exact same amount of time. The man traveling to the far country must be the Lord Jesus Christ. He has gone away and the time for his return is not known for certain. The wise thing to do is to be diligent in using our time and to be prepared when the Lord returns. In the parable, the talents are a sum of money. But what do these talents represent for us, the servants of the Lord today? Alfred Adersheim says in his book, The Life and Times of Christ the Messiah, that the talents refer to all that a man has wherewith to serve Christ. For all that the Christian has, his time, money, opportunities, talents, or learning, and not only the word, is Christ's and is entrusted to us, not for custody, but to trade with all for the absent master, to further the progress of his kingdom. And to each of us, he gives according to our capacity for working, mental, moral, and even physical. To one, five, to another, two, and to another, one talent. This capacity for work lies not within our own power, but it is in our power to use for Christ whatever we may have. The talents are given to each of these men based on their ability. 
and it is their master who determines what each man will receive. What is important is that each of these men use the talents that are given to him, even though the amounts may differ. It is a mistake to begin making comparisons or to begin making excuses. The five-talent man was given two and a half times more than what the two-talent man was given, and he was given four times more than what was given to the one-talent man. The amount given to each one is not as critical as the desire of each man to use his talents for the master. Both the men who worked and used their talents were given similar commendations and told that they could enter into the joy of the Lord. These men had worked vigorously for the master. They accepted the responsibility that was given to them. They refused to give in to fear and made no excuses for not working. The very first thing that the one talent man did was accuse his master of being the reason for his lack of effort. He blamed his laziness and neglect on the master. And he tried to justify his own inaction based on the character and the expectations of the master. Lord, I knew you were a hard man and you reap where you have not sown. And so I was afraid. There is a huge difference between a reason and an excuse. For instance, I might say, I cannot go for a run because I have a broken leg. That is a reason. Or I might say, I cannot go for a run because I don't have time. And that is very likely an excuse. We make time for those things that we want to do and make excuses for the things that we do not want to do. It was foolish for the one talent man to make his master's character his excuse for not working. When the one talent man said that he was afraid, that may well have been the truth. And it may have been true of the five talent man and the two talent man that they had some fears but it was still not a good reason for inaction. Did he really believe that the fact that he did not lose the talent meant that he had been faithful? He had not worked at all with the talent. He simply hid it in the ground. The master accused this man of being wicked and lazy. The one talent man did not accept his responsibility and he did not work. He did not even do the least that he could have done. He could have at least put it in the bank and it would have earned interest. Now it may seem unfair to us that the talent that this one talent man had was given to the 10 talent man. As we read, for to everyone who has more will be given and he will have an abundance. Those who use the master's resources faithfully continually gain more, while those who shirk their responsibilities lose even what they had. This one talent man's heart was alienated from the master. He served him not, and he knew him not. If he worked, he worked for himself. He would not incur the difficulties, the self-denial, perhaps even the reproach connected with the master's work. He was among those who through self-indulgence and worldliness will not do the work for Christ with the one talent entrusted to them. This is the life of missed opportunities and regrets. The fate of this unprofitable servant is the same as that of the guest at the marriage feast who was not wearing a wedding garment. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
And we might add again that there was only regret for missed opportunities for this one talent man. Next, let's read from the book of Luke, the 19th chapter, verses 11 through 27, the parable of the minas. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. This parable of the miners begins with an explanation regarding the expectations of many of the people regarding the kingdom. They, of course, were mistaken in their expectations. First, they believed that the kingdom would appear immediately, and that would not be the case. And second, they were mistaken about the nature of the kingdom. They were looking for a physical kingdom immediately, with the Messiah ascending the throne of David in Jerusalem and exalting Israel to the head of all the nations. The kingdom would be a spiritual kingdom, though, that would be spread around the world, not with the sword and spear, but with the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Physical Israel would dissolve into spiritual Israel. The nobleman who went into the far country to receive a kingdom is Jesus. The citizens who hated him and did not want him to rule over them were the Jews who opposed Jesus and who finally crucified him. Even though each servant in this parable was given the same amount, one mina, there is one man who gains ten minas and another who gains five. And to each of these two men the same commendation is given. They are each given more trust and more responsibility to exercise in the kingdom. They worked faithfully. They made good use of the mina given to them. The man who did not work and showed no increase received a condemnation. Once again, there was an attempt by this man to lay blame on the character and the expectations of the master. He accuses the master of being an austere man, and that is his excuse for doing nothing with the mina. At the end of the parable, 
The enemies of the master are slain before him. In 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed along with the temple and the economy and the policies of Judaism. Those enemies of the master who harassed and opposed him throughout his personal ministry on earth and finally crucified him were removed from power and their earthly kingdom was taken from them. In Luke's gospel, at the end of this parable, he tells us that Jesus went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Jesus went there knowing the things that would happen in Jerusalem. As Luke says in another place, he set his face steadfastly to go up to Jerusalem. And he went there to face the cross to purchase our salvation. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit that are given to the church. In verses 12 through 19 of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Every gift of God comes to the church through God's grace for the purpose of increasing his assets and not ours. There should be no competition and there should be no shame in using the gift that is given no matter how small it may seem. Each one of us must use our gifts to reach the lost and to serve our neighbor. There are no backseat gifts or less important gifts in the kingdom of God. Every gift that God gives is critical and it has a place in increasing the kingdom of God. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The gifts given to us are not for our own profit. They're for the profit of the body of Christ, for the profit of the kingdom. And so may we be faithful in using our gifts to increase the kingdom and to bring glory to God. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the wonderful love that you have showered upon us in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're so thankful for the sacrifice that he made for us and for the privilege that you have given to us to be a part of your body, of your kingdom here upon the earth, and that you have given to us gifts that we can use in your service. And so, Father, please bless us and help us to use every advantage that we have, every gift that you have given to further the kingdom and to reach out to our neighbors and others around us with the saving message of the gospel of Jesus. And may we allow your love to be shed abroad in our hearts to others as we care for those who are sick or who are hungry or who are thirsty, as we minister to the lost and the dying in this world. Father, help us every day to remember that we are given this day to serve you. And may we have no regrets. May we not be afraid. And may we not be ashamed, no matter how small our gift may be that you've given us, 
to use it to bless others and to further your kingdom. And so help us, Father, to be faithful servants who may one day hear your commendation. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you are having a good week this week as we anticipate the coming of summer. It's still kind of cool uh, here in May, this time of year in our uh, section of the country. Uh, but we pray that wherever you are, that things are well. We do ask a special prayer at this time for our brothers and sisters in the nation of India who are experiencing a real resurgence of the COVID virus and are having some very difficult times. And so we ask you to join with us in prayer for the nation of India and that things may uh, progress and that they may get a, a handle on this virus and be able to overcome the situation that they're in now. We thank you again for tuning in. Pray that you'll be with us in our next study. God bless and keep you until we meet again. Sing unto the Lord a song of gladness, let the earth proclaim the joyful sound. Lift up your voice and now rejoice, she who his name confess. Tell the world of full and free salvation, tell how Jesus died that we might live. To every race his saving grace brings truth. And righteousness. Sing sing unto the Lord, O soul, sing morning forever praise his Come and worship him with heart and voice in true accord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, our God of all creation. Give to him eternal. Sing unto the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a song of triumph. Evil forces strive in vain to win. When God is near, have ye no fear, for he will never fail. Sing, O ye who are his chosen people. Sing, for he hath given victory. Our God is he. Eternally his power shall prevail. Sing and sing unto the Lord, Lord O soul, sing for him forever praise his Come and sing worship him with heart and voice in true accord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, the God of all creation. Give to him eternal glory, sing unto the Lord.